Fox 5 and Hot 97 present Street Soldiers with Lisa Evers. I'm so glad you're joining us for this episode of Street Soldiers on the criminalization of hip hop. I'm Lisa Evers. We're seeing more big name hip hop artists facing serious criminal charges, often alleging violent gang activity. We're also seeing a rise in gang imagery in the music. So is hip hop being targeted or is there simply more crime? Hip hop artist Young Thug, real name Jeffrey Williams, and Gunna, whose legal name is Sergio Kitchens, made international headlines when they were named along with 26 others in an 88-page racketeering indictment. Georgia prosecutors allege the rappers are part of a Bloods-affiliated gang called Young Slime Life, or YSL, which is also the name of their music collective. Here we are again with some young black males that's like multimillionaires making a bunch of money, but they can't leave the streets alone. So we got to get rid of this, keep it real and hip hop. Young Thug is a successful hip hop artist with three number one billboard hits. His close associate, Gunna, made his own mark. Prosecutors say Young Thug used money from his music for mayhem on the streets, allegedly paying for a rental car that was used in a deadly drive-by shooting, among other criminal gang activities. We are proud to bring forth this indictment and hopefully to bring justice to a lot of the community who was victimized. In another high-profile case, Brooklyn rapper Casanova pleaded guilty to federal racketeering and narcotics charges for his alleged role with the untouchable Gorilla Stone Nation Bloods Gang. These cases stand out not just for the fame of those involved, but by the double-digit numbers of those accused. Some defense attorneys say it can be guilt by association. These very weighty types of charges, particularly when they're applied to criminal organizations, it's very serious because even to the extent that these particular rappers had a lesser or a minor role, it doesn't matter in the nature of a RICO case. Definitely a, uh, a connection between inner city violence, uh, gun violence, and rap music. And I think that uh, uh, law enforcement would uh, not be doing what's investigatively prudent to not acknowledge that connection and then investigate it. The Young Thug and Gunna arrests are having an impact on artists, says music industry executive Bobby Fisher. You just have to really be careful how you move nowadays. You know, artists are being more careful who understand that their whole brand could be ruined because of certain situations. You know, obviously you can't remove an artist that comes from an impoverished environment or neighborhood, but just make sure that moving forward that they're on the straight and narrow. With our nation undergoing a crime wave, everyone's looking for answers. Let's find out what our panel has to say. Joining me is Ralph Salento. He's a former NYPD Lieutenant Commander of Detectives, investigated many high profile cases. Ralph, great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you're also a professor at John Jay College. Correct, yes. Thank you so much. Also with us is Philip, Philip Hamilton. He's a criminal defense attorney and managing partner at Hamilton Clark LLP. Phil, great to have you with us. Lisa, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Also joining us is Bobby Fisher. He's a vice president of a &R at Empire Records. Bobby, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me again, Lisa. Okay, so Bobby, I'm gonna start with you because you are on the front lines there in the record business, the music industry out there traveling. You see what's happening all around the country. Why do you think we're seeing so many cases like this of hip hop artists getting caught up in, and not just the up and coming ones who may still have been close to the streets, but people that have really been successful for almost a decade? Uh, I mean, I think obviously the, uh, the glorification of social media has kind of intensified things. So, you know, you know, compared to even 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or even even five years ago, the, the informational highway is, is at a fast pace. So obviously, you know, ne negative things sometimes get a, a news headline a little bit more than the positive things. So we're just dealing with the informational highway where things are just being intensified times 10 when it comes to, you know, alleged situations where, you know, criminal activity could be involved. Phil, why do you think we're seeing so many of these cases? I think we're seeing so many of these cases just because when you think back to, let's just start with 2020, a lot of the gun violence that we've seen, a lot of just that pandemic infused violence I think has been the precursor to a lot of these investigations going on. I think also a lot of when we talk about what happened with the pandemic, 
so much went virtual. There was so much more online in terms of social media, in terms of the internet. And I think that it gave investigators almost a leg up in regards to investigations that maybe they already had going on, but certainly also helped them in regards to commencing investigations because you had a lot of the evidence, you had a lot of the underpinnings of these offenses just out there for everybody to see, for everybody to read. And a lot of these people had no qualms with putting it out there that were being investigated. So I think that in many respects is a large part of why we're seeing these investigations right now, Lisa. Ralph, you think that a, that a lot of these cases, that this whole phenomenon is nothing new. Why do you say that? Well, let's not forget that uh, the federal government targeting uh, music acts is, is certainly not new, right? It dates all the way back to the 50s where Elvis Presley got involved in that. And then after that, they went after Nat King Cole and Duke Ellington for communism and then Jimi Hendrix after that. And when you move into the 80s, it was uh, Twisted Sister and Two Live Crew and NWA where, you know, remember that D. Snyder from Twisted Sister testified in a congressional hearing and said that uh, the interpretation of lyrics leads to little more than character assassination. And that was from his congressional testimony. And I think as we go on and further on through time, I agree with uh, Bobby and Phil both that the technology today is far superior. And here's the other thing, is that this is kind of a, a, a weird paradox for rappers, right? Like they need to rely on social media and YouTube and things like this to, to get their product out there. But at the same time, right? This is the, this is the, the hand that bites is they're, they're using that to get out there. But then the, the federal government is also using it, right? In order to enhance prosecutorial cases. So Bobby, this, the, the, the social media, do you think this is really at the crux of all of this? Because they need the artists need the social media for the fans, for the views, for the clout and all of that. And to, and to, to get streams for their music. But by the same token, a lot of them are, as Phil said, are, are, are pretty reckless about what they're putting out there. Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy. You have to be mindful for artists. You have to be mindful of what you post. I mean, you know, sometimes we, we, we often forget on, on things that can be very impressionable for, you know, for the public and for the kids out there. And, you know, and, and if you are posting something that's, that, that's questionable, that can probably put yourself in trouble. You have to be careful. I mean, any, you know, things that you post is one thing, but it can also happen for direct messages as well. It's easy for law enforcement or investigative, you know, um, agency to to get a subpoena and, and go through your messages. I think that's what happened to Casanova. You know, you know, um, you know. I I only know Casanova for music, but it can it can it can dwell into different you know deep areas if you don't know what you're doing. There's more to come. Stay with us, Ralph. When you look at these cases, you well, let, let's just talk about the Young Thug case and the. And Gunna, which shocked a lot of people, the, these indictments that basically saying that their YSL um, music collective is actually a gang, a very active gang. What did you think of that case? Well, I think certainly the evidence would have to be there to support that. I mean, uh, the technology allows uh, subpoenas of social media and cell phones. And, you know, people have to remember that no matter where you go, no matter what you do today, you leave an electronic footprint everywhere. So uh, I'm sure that if they created a case like this, uh, don't forget the crimes exist first. And then uh, these people are mentioned and investigated. So uh, I think that there would have to be a case that would have to be built. Uh, I'm sure that if the uh, prosecuting attorney uh, brings charges like this, I I'm sure they have a timeline and uh, ample electronic evidence. Uh, along with uh, some eyewitness testimony, probably. Phil, in terms of the Young Thug and Gunna case, 28, 28 people in, uh, people indicted, all of these different charges. It's a state RICO case. So that gave, gave them, explain what that means for us. Cause we, we keep hearing it's a RICO case. Oh yeah, it's a RICO case. Some people know, but what, what does that really mean? I mean, just breaking it all the way down, Lisa, what it boils down to, whether it's at the state level, where, whether it's at the federal level, you're dealing with a racketeering case. You're dealing with a case, whether it's either it's the state government or the federal government, that's ultimately trying to break up what they are alleging to be a criminal enterprise, a criminal organization, a la when we think back to the 80s and the mob, or when we think about some of the other, you know, big gangs, the MS-13s, whomever, to the extent that the government alleges you to be involved in an enterprise that at its core involves criminal activity, they can, what 
typically will be done either at the state or federal level is implement these RICO laws, which allow the state to basically charge one within the organization with the overt acts and criminal activity of others. So if you are the rental car, you're the rent, you're the guy that rents the car for all. Like, like in the young thug, like in the I'm sorry to cut you off, but like in the young thug case, the prosecutors alleged that he paid for the rent a car that was used in this drive by shooting that there killed somebody. Go. There you go, Lisa. So to the extent that you financed the rental car or it was in your name, even if you didn't ultimately pull the trigger, you can be charged with it because you were a part of the organization and helped in your overt acts to allow that criminal activity to occur. And that catches a lot of people up because they say, hey, I'm getting arrested for this. I didn't pull the trigger. I didn't even know ultimately what they were going to do. But to the extent that you know that they needed to rent a car for some gang related activity, right, or some activity that all of you were doing collectively together, you can be charged with it, you can be convicted of it. So it really goes to the point of sometimes watching the company that you keep, particularly if you're not in the hardcore aspects of a criminal organization, just being affiliated in many respects can end up getting you a lot of time. And, the, and that point you raised, the company you keep, Bobby, what about this? Is this like guilt by association? But help us understand, because a lot of people feel, all right, we understand you're young, you're, you're on the streets, you're hustling, whatever. Then you get some hit records, you start to have a real music career and really pursue that. But there's not really, it doesn't seem to be a sharp line between the streets and then also making music. Is, is, are these cases, do you feel uh, guilt by association? Uh, it's, it's almost like the old saying our grandmother used to say one one bad apple spoils the bunch a little bit. So, right. you know, I, I think intently, you know, obviously from the record side, I think artists, you know, main goal is to, you know, one, be the best art, recording artist they can be. One, not leave their friends and family and loved ones behind, put them in a position of, you know, uh, doing things legit and, and help building the brand. I think that's the goal. Um, I think at times where these situations happen and do occur, is that we're starting to run into problems where, you know, think you know, th crimes are being accused of, and artists have to prove to themselves in the court of law that they're not involved in criminal activity. And so, it's definitely an unfortunate situation, and and artists have to constantly. It's not just one time; it's all the time to be a reminder of understanding of, of the people that you keep around. Make sure everyone's on the up and up because they can. It takes a, a lifetime to build a brand, but it can take a second to destroy it. Bobby, do you think artists, especially the, the up and coming ones, understand that when they put something on social media, whether it's a TikTok or an Instagram or wherever, that that is basically like putting their business on the street? I don't think they know uh, initially in the beginning. They feel like if it's coming from them, it's self-expression. They believe it's not telling on themselves, but inadvertently you are. Um, and you, like I always say, you always have to be mindful of what you post because it can leave a lasting impression impression on you. So I, I don't think they initially know in the beginning, but if they start to understand the ramifications of what's happening to other artists and they see, you know, you know, especially in Georgia, they're saying they were monitoring social media, it it it, it can it can uh it can uh, it can put you in a bad situation if you if you're not using it correctly. Phil, is it hard to defend a case when there's an electronic trail? of DMs and, and phone messages and text messages? It can be hard, but it, look, I, I've litigated these matters where we're dealing both with the text messages and phone records. I've also litigated the matters where we're dealing with, you know, implicit assertions and, you know, admissions via social media, right? I, I, I've dealt with both. And, and what I would say in terms of the, the difficulty, it, it can be difficult because sometimes like it lines up directly with where the state or the feds are trying to take the case. There are other times where it can be a bit more circumstantial, but even in those situations where like it's wholly circumstantial and, you know, as Ralph noted, you know, earlier, you can go into the case with a good fight because it's a bit weak, still going through the process of like going to trial and the risk that are attendant with that. I don't advise it for anyone, particularly depending on what jurisdiction are you in? Are you trying this case in the Bronx? Are you trying this case in Staten Island? Are you trying this case in the Southern District? Where are you? Are you in White Plains or are you down in Manhattan? What's your jury pool? It's a little bit harder sometimes when it comes to the rap lyrics or the admissions on social media to put across to jurors who don't understand the culture or the language or what's being said in the text messages that this is still nevertheless innocent behavior. It's part of the art. Whereas you have other juries and you know demographics within certain counties or jurisdictions that are gonna understand that. But I don't advise any client to put themselves in a position 
to where we have to fight it at trial. Because even if we can win, it's never a guarantee. And what can be a better guarantee is just watch what you say and watch what you put out there. Ralph, what, what do you say to people who, who, who believe, well, that, you know, a, a lot, in a lot of these cases, they're basically handling, handing a case to the prosecutors on a silver platter or even the detectives because there's evidence, they're bragging about stuff, they're talking about stuff. This is the duplicity, right? This is the Pandora's box we're in because a lot of times art imitates life and a lot of times it doesn't. There are several, several thousand songs out there where the lyrics are just the lyrics and uh, they're open to interpretation. And there are several songs out there. Like for instance, right now, Jacksonville, Florida has a case mm -hmm. uh, where a rapper is suspected of doing, uh, a, at least being involved in a triple homicide. So a short time after that, he released a song where he basically spells out how the murder occurred. And then he names the three victims by name. I mean, so the Jacksonville Police Department right now in Florida has a special team and their sole function is to monitor up and coming rap videos. And so a lot of times you're right. I think these guys tell on themselves. I know I could speak from personal experience that I've closed at least three homicides by uh, an, an aggress aggressively monitoring social media and then having that evidence admitted into trial. So uh, I think both things are happening. I think guys do are reckless about doing it. You know, I also think a lot of times uh, they're, they're speaking from the first person. Uh, they, they grew up in this neighborhood. They grew up around drug violence. So whether they're talking about it in the first person or they're talking about what they've seen, uh, you know, these guys are artists, they're musicians, they're writing about what they know. Bobby, how hard is it for artists, especially new artists, to, to separate themselves from people that might be involved, still be involved in, in gang activity on the streets? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's extremely hard for artists who comes from environments where, you know, potentially there's, there's gang activity. These are the, the guys and, you know, potential family members you grew up with your whole life. You know, you know artists pride themselves in, in keeping that authenticity, knowing where you come from, getting that stamp of approval from your neighborhood or from the city that you're from, and you don't want to be labeled as, you know, the old school word in the 90s, the sellout or, you know, the guy that, that forgot yeah. our, about our people. And, right. um, you know, what artists tend to do, which they've been doing since the days of time, is to make sure they keep the crew OK. I, my crew is always down with me, my day ones. Well, your day ones might be snitch ones. So you just have to be careful or they could be corrupt ones. <laughs> you know, the ones that corrupted your, your whole brand from the beginning, you don't even know it. So you just have to be careful for an artist that's coming up because you got people at your crew that might not even be equipped to even handle your, your music business aspirations. So they want to prove it up to you that they can do other things and it can be de detrimental to what you have going on. Bill, in, ter in terms of people protecting themselves, in terms of the associations, is it seems in some of these federal cases, like the association itself can be can can put you under the uh, in the crosshairs of the law. Yes, and it can put you at trial. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I've seen it. I, I've lived it. Uh, there was a trial we tried in uh, front of Judge Rakoff uh, in the Southern District of New York last year, April of twenty one, and and that case had all of these undertones. Right, like it was legitimately text messages that were taken out of context. It was affiliations that client had at one time, but that he legit had been in the process of relieving himself from. But because of those affiliations, some misinterpretations within the text messages, as my co-counsel in that matter was always so fond of saying, you can make a federal case out of anything, right? So that's why they always say, don't make a federal case out of it, right? And those affiliations can at times help the federal government make a case where there wasn't one particularly if our you know, focus here in this show is with respect to the rappers, right? They, in many respects, are always implicitly assumed to be the bankrollers of whatever organization is going on, right? In terms of whether there's any money laundering type issues or in terms of how is the gang able within any of these videos or within what's being seen on social media to live the way in which they're living, the presumption is, well, it must be you know, Casanova's money. The presumption is it must be such and such as money that is financing the ability of this gang to still continue forth and basically have more power because they have more resources coming in from the hip hop. 
Ralph, there still are crimes that are being committed, like the like the murder in Atl in Atlanta. There's or illegal gun use or or things like that. Correct? Absolutely, it's very very tough to cut those ties. And if you if you are involved in a murder or you know about a murder, or you conspired to kill murder murder. That doesn't just go away. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Street Soldiers. You can watch it again on our Fox 5 NY YouTube page. Remember, use your mind. It's your best weapon. I'm Lisa Evers. Let's push for peace, love, and justice for all. <laughs>